Hello everyone and um, welcome to uh, my talk on perioperative cesarean delivery analgesia and how we can personalize um, this approach. So I've got no conflict of interest to declare and um, yeah, Prof Woodendall once compared pain to the Great Wall of China. It's long, unending, winding with complex physiology and then this man Bram Malherbe came and he ran 4,500 kilometers of the Great Wall of China. So uh, today let's run through cesarean delivery analgesia and let's see uh, what we can uh, do to, to improve our understanding and uh, the care of our patients. Now we know pain is subjective and there is great genetic variation experiences differ, resources and the context we're all working in would be different and uh, the often used one size fits all sort of approach does not work. So what can we do to improve um, our exp uh, experience and um, the care of our patients and uh, we're going to look at uh, the context we're all working in with uh, starting with the rates in South Africa um, the impact it has on our patients, expectations and uh, comparing high income and low and middle income settings. Then delve a bit more and uh, give definition to um, preoperative assessments, multimodal analgesia um, and specifically focusing on neuroaxial analgesia, basic simple analgesics like paracetamol and non -steroidals. Uh, touching on ERAS principles and then ending off with nursing staff education, very important team members. So in the public system we see that the total number of caesarean deliveries currently approaching 2,700, uh, 270,000 270, seizures per year with the average rate for the country at 28% and this is in the public system. In the private system according to the Discovery Health tracker data we're seeing that the percentage is as high as 75% so a huge burden um, on our health care. In the presence of this um, burden there are important other important issues like maternal mortality um, which will often overshadow pain relief. So the real challenge is how to personalize analgesia for cesarean delivery without increasing the workload and service pressures. A study from our hospital by Marian Retief in 2016 looked at acute postoperative pain in 1,231 patients at a developing country uh, referral hospital. Um, and looked at incidents and risk factors. And what they found was of that 1,231 patients, 62% indicated their maximum pain as moderate or severe. Procedures with the highest incidence were cesarean sections with over 80% incidence. So truly um, a factor to consider is that uh, our patients are still experiencing um, moderate to severe pain in 2020. So what is the impact uh, of cesarean delivery? Moving on to context and resources, we see that um, if you're working in a large academic hospital like Tigerberg Hospital where I work, your resources and um, staff, levels of staff would be different to that found in private or high income settings as this Sidra Medicines in Qatar uh, where this hospital specifically caters for the needs of women and children and definitely different to the rural setting where many of our colleagues often don't have very basic analgesics. So we see when treating pain we have to consider what are the patient's comorbidities lack of staff, staff skill level, access to essential medications, equipment, critical care support and government pol policies um, in each one of these settings 
and we have to take that into consideration. So what are patient expectations? Again, if your context is a high income setting like Stanford in the US, um, it is definitely pain. Pain, fears, patients' fears and concerns regarding analgesia are ranked right as number one during and after cesarean section. Um, and this was already confirmed in 2005 by Carvalho and colleagues. On the other side of the spectrum, if um, we look at this study by Kintu in Uganda, we see that um, in this study, 42% of patients received no analgesia and still 68% of uh, these patients were satisfied with their care. So patients' expectations in another setting might be completely different. Why is this? Well, expectations differ. Patients do not want to appear weak in front of their families. There might be fear of increased length of stay, as in this study in uh, Timor-Leste, a small, um, um, low middle income country in Asia. And we have to take patients' expectations into account. If we move on to preoperative session now, we see that, is it possible for us to predict post cesarean delivery pain? And the answer is yes, there are preoptive indicators like quantity, uh, quantitative sensory testing, um, studies like electrical or heat pain thresholds, scar hyperalgesia um, where patients had previous cesarean sections, pain during local anesthesia infiltration when patients complain of pain um, when you numb the back before you uh, perform your cesarean section or the patient has a drip and that IV site patients complain of that, that might be an indicator as well. And then questionnaires on previous experiences of pain. All of these have been shown to have predictive value. Patients give a history of chronic pain. That's a definite yes. General anesthesia is associated with increased post-operative pain. And then surgical factors like an extended vertical incision or repeated cesarean sections. All increase patients' risk for post-cesarean delivery pain. If we can predict question then is can we prevent pain and in a recent review article by Audrey Horn she discusses preventative pain psychoeducation and its potential application as a multimodal perioperative pain control option. She says that analgesic approaches only focus on pharmacological means while completely neglecting the psychological aspects. High levels of preoperative anxiety are associated with higher levels of pain directly one week and three months post-operatively. Appropriate psychological intervention may provide patients with not only preemptive benefit, but also multimodal advantage in their recovery. So she emphasizes the role that anxiety plays in pain and how this can be alleviated by patient information. And the absolute importance of preoperative information what should patients expect, um, their pain during the course of the hospital stay and the analgesic plan that is intended or, or uh, personalized for them and give patients choices as well in analgesia. Anxiety reduction uh, is very important and uh, the role of psychological information systems like video, multimedia and counseling sessions, even if it's uh, shortly before the procedure, is of great value. If, uh, if there is a need for pharmacological management of anxiety, um, Sanel and colleagues have already shown um, that a dose of 0.025 milligrams per kilogram midazolam has a great reduction on anxiety scores uh, for patients coming for elective caesarean section and also APGAR scores of their newborns. Other drugs that have been used is dexmetotomidine and gabapentin um, for pharmacological management of anxiety reduction. And this is not a drug that's commonly used 
but in selected cases, one might opt for pharmacological agents to reduce anxiety. And I'm especially thinking about um, intrauterine deaths and um, the anxiety around that to re uh, reduce uh, mother's anxieties. So moving on to um, multimodal um, analgesia plan now and the optimal bupivacaine dose. Um, we know that the majority of cesarean deliveries are done by spinal anesthesia. This is important to find the optimal bupivacaine dose to ensure adequate analgesia. The rationale for reducing doses of bupivacaine is to reduce the sympathectomy, um, which is obviously leads to a drop in blood pressure, but at the risk of increased intraoperative pain, where a conversion to GA has the risk of a difficult airway. So Guinnessar and Carvalho published dose response curves for both hyperbaric and isobaric bupivacaine. And what they found is that the ED95 for a successful operation for isobaric bupivacaine is 13 milligrams and that for hyperbaric bupivacaine is 11.2 milligrams. Very important to start your spinal anesthetic and the start of the surgery with the correct dose and not to then have the need for a conversion later during the case, especially during difficult surgery. Um, moving on to multimodal protocols, then there are many of these um, on in the literature, but this was an excellent review article by Caitlin Sutton titled Optimal Pain Management of Cesarean Delivery. And uh, she suggests an analgesic protocol uh, for post-cesarean delivery where she emphasizes the role of neuraxial morphine followed by non-steroidals and uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen as they call it in the US and then in selected small selected group of patients with ongoing or severe post-operative pain which comes to around about 20 percent of patients um, where one needs more in the form of adjuncts or other options and we're going to look at the detail of that just now. So moving on to neuraxial opioids now, um, these are truly the gold standard for cesarean delivery analgesia, whether it's the intrathecal route or the epidural route. Factors to consider here is how, how would this, uh, these drugs influence your block quality, the onset and duration of action, side effects, neonatal depression, and breast milk transfer. So. Firstly, intrathecal fentanyl in a um, meta-analysis by Apple and colleagues, um, looking at more than a thousand patients, comparing 10 and 25 micrograms. What they found was that there was an 82% reduction in the need for intraoperative analgesia supplementation, 59% reduction in intraoperative nausea and vomiting, but pruritus had a six-fold increase in the incidence. Um, so the next question then is, uh, if we know that fentanyl, intrathecal fentanyl is effective, what is the optimal dose? And we see that um, uh, studies looking at uh, between 10 and 25 micrograms, um, they, Ali and colleagues in 2018 found that there was really no block difference in onset between these uh, different dosages. Analgesia intraoperatively had no difference. Block duration, slight uh, prolongation in the 25 microgram group, but clinically really not significant if you compare 113 versus 136 minutes. Increased pruritus and vomiting with the 25 microgram group and no differences in APGARS. So I, I think that um, the evidence is quite clear that uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 micrograms, you will find the optimal balance of analgesia and the side effects. And that is what I use as well. If we move on to intrathecal morphine now, this is truly the gold standard single shot technique where great analgesia with an onset of around about 90 minutes and there are very varying dosages giving a duration of up to 24 hours um, with 50 micrograms considered an ultra low dose 
50 to 150 micrograms a low dose and greater than 150 micrograms a high dose. Side effects to look out for is respiratory depression, nausea, vomiting, pruritus and sedation. We're going to look at that closer now. If we move on to intrathecal morphine duration and pruritus, um, comparing the low dose and the high dose group, we see that Sultan and colleagues um, in a meta-analysis in 2016 um, compared these dosages and in 11 articles that met the inclusion criteria, they found that there was only a small mean difference uh, between these groups in duration of action. Um, but the side effect on the side effect group, the forest plot um, favors the lower dose group um, for um, side effects of uh, pruritus and nausea vomiting. So I think there's a the evidence is quite clear that the lower dose um, has definite benefit um, without these side effects. And they conclude by saying that this meta-analysis shows that high doses of intrathecal morphine prolong analgesia after cesarean, cesarean delivery compared with lower doses. The mean difference of four and a half hours of pain relief must be balanced against the increased risk of maternal pruritus and vomiting. Um, and um, this is again uh, what we use in our pain guideline of Tigerberg as well. The most feared side effect is respiratory depression, which is often the single factor preventing wide implementation of this gold standard cesarean delivery analgesia. In an excellent consensus statement by the Society of Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology, Boshaw and colleagues define monitoring recommendations for the prevention and detection of respiratory depression associated with an axial morphine for cesarean delivery analgesia. Um, and from this consensus statement, um, they write and say that the incidence of respiratory depression following neuraxial morphine has been reported to range between 0 and 1.3% when bradypnea is used as a clinical measure of respiratory depression. A, a one large res retrospective study of more than 5,000 women who received intrathecal or epidural morphine for cesarean delivery aimed to capture clinical relevant episodes of respiratory depression and they could find no cases. Uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists Closed Claims Product Database from 1990 to 2009 could only find one case of respiratory depression and it wasn't a case where neuraxial morphine was used. It was actually a continuous epidural infusion of pupivacaine and fentanyl. In the latest 2015 Mothers and Babies Reducing Risk throughout audits, confidential inquiries of the UK, looking at more than 2,300 pregnancies, um, there were no deaths that were attributable to maternal or axial opioid administration. And then lastly, they conclude and say, clinically significant respiratory depression indicating an incidence of one 0 0.08 per 10,000. Um, so the risk of morbidity and mortality in the healthy obstetric patients following administration of a low dose of neuraxial morphine ex appears extremely low. So uh, in the same statement, uh, there is an excellent respiratory monitoring algorithm following neuraxial morphine for cesarean delivery analgesia and um, what I like about this um, algorithm is that it, it groups the, um, it stratifies patients into risk, the low risk um, healthy patient, as opposed to the high risk patients. And, and the cases here, which we all know would be the high BMI with OSA, um, chronic opioid abuse, hypertension, magnesium administration, this would be your high risk group. And then your near axial morphine dosing group, and it's a specific, specifically this ultra low dose that that we are looking at in our guideline for Tigerberg, and then your respiratory frequency monitoring here. And they say here routine post-operative vital sign monitoring, no additional respiratory monitoring required. Okay, and this is included in our guideline, which you're welcome to look at. 
So what is the risk of unnecessary monitoring of our patients? Sleep deprivation, exhaustion, difficulty with breastfeeding, and postpartum depression. So all of these have to be weighed up against the risk of respiratory depression. And I do think that um, often our patients um, do suffer because of these um, unnecessary monitoring that is done. Looking at uh, or concluding then for neuroaxial morphine, it has been shown to be superior analgesia, uh, systemic opioids, two systemic opioids and local anesthetic blocks. Respiratory depression has got a very low incidence and there's less nursing staff uh, workload uh, when uh, neuroaxial opioids have been used. If we move on to systemic opioids now, systemic opioids are really kept for breakthrough pain and that's their role. Uh, they are um, IV routes are not superior to oral routes. Um, codeine is not recommended due to the pharmacogenomic metabolic variability in the efficacy and side effects. Intravenous routes should really be kept when oral is not available and PCA without background infusions have got greater patient uh, satisfaction. Persistent opioid use, and this is a specific problem in the high income setting. Um, it has been shown that one in 300 opioid naive women undergoing caesarean delivery would become persistent opioid users, um, as shown by Bateman in 2016. So we really don't want to expose our patients to unnecessary long-term persistent opioids. And uh, that's why it is so important to optimize your paracetamol and non-steroidals. Routine oral use every six hours. Um, paracetamol has got a 20 to 40 opioid sparing effect um, if combined with non-steroidals. Um, the key here is routinely use, the routine use every six hours um, and um, ensuring that the patient is not without the non-steroidals. Um, COX-2 is reserved for patients that are intolerant to non-selective non-steroidals. If we move on to the local anesthetics now, uh, there are multiple options that one can choose from from wound infiltration, epidurals, tap blocks, QL blocks, erectospinal blocks, and others. Um, there's a definite benefit uh, when GAs are used for caesarean deliveries. Um, when spinal anesthesia with intrathecal morphine is uh, the main focus of your analgesia plan, there's minimal benefit of a single dose of local anesthetics. Catheters, when local anesthetics are used, should be subfacial rather than subcutaneous and always part of a multimodal analgesia plan and ultrasound guided as far as possible. Adjuvants um, like dexamethasone, magnesium sulfate and catarolac as part of the local anesthetic infiltration or blocks um, need more um, studies and the current evidence for this is um, is not convincing. When we look at tab blocks, it's by far the most studied block, um, especially the ultrasound guided posterior approach um, has been studied extensively. Um, there's no additional benefit when um, intrathecal morphine is used and one should decrease your pupipicane dose uh, to less than 50 milligrams per side due to the risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Um, the surgical tap block was first described by Owen, um, where this technique is the, um, applied by the surgeon that punctures the peritoneum and delivers the local anesthetic in the transversus abdominis plane um, into the in, in, uh, abdominis plane and um, this thin block has got excellent results uh, as shown by 
um, Kakade as well, where the, the infiltration is done while the caesarean is taking place or at the end of the caesarean section with significant um, analgesic benefits. So especially in the context where ultrasound is not available, um, in the high risk patients where we want additional analgesia, um, this is a great technique and especially in the obese population as well we we just want to end up through the um, through the muscle into this transversus abdominis plane and I, I do think that there is a place to add the surgical tab block as well um, chondratus lumborum blocks um, are growing in interest with many studies and i'm sure we're gonna see more this is um, due to the greater spread of local anesthetic compared to tap blocks and uh, many studies now coming out with QL blocks 1, 2 and 3. Um, a few good uh, case reports of caesarean sections performed uh, in the literature on erector spinae blocks and um, an easy block which um, could have benefit in selected patients and that is part of our armamentarium to be able to do this block successfully and safely. If we look at adjuncts uh, that we can apply uh, as part of our uh, 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 treatment, ketamine has been there for a long time and in a low dose of 0.15 to 0.25 milligrams per kilogram there's a definite benefit and potential uh, chronic pain benefit as well. Dexamethasone has been improved, uh, has been used in a wide dose range between 1 and 20 milligrams. Um, improves pain relief in general anesthesia, spinal anesthesia, and no optimal dose has been decided on yet. Maybe a risk of higher glucose levels at 24 hours. Gabapentanoids, there was an initial enthusiasm for a single preoperative dose of gabapentin, 600 milligrams. Um, to decrease post cesarean pain and increase maternal satisfaction has been uh, tempered by subsequent studies that did not show a significant analgesic effect. And um, when it comes to pregrabulin, there's even a higher transfer of the fetus to breast milk. So uh, definitely not a drug to use routinely. And um, I would consider these drugs in a, the sort of the chronic pain um, risk group of patients where I would like to add or use an adjunct. Non-pharmacological techniques um, are available especially in the well resource setting um, where hypnosis, imagery, music therapy um, can assist. Um, I've had experience with TENS in the UK where it modulates pain um, activate uh, the descending pathways and yes in selected patients it can have a benefit. If we quickly have a look at ERAS in caesarean delivery pain there are many studies out and many um, uh, programs now for ERAS as did Kleinman a year in their study where they included um, pain relief and a, a multimodal analgesia plan as part of the ERAS principle and what did they found? ERAS re resulted in a 38% reduction in total post cesarean operative opioid consumption. So really a place for ERAS principles um, in cesarean delivery and I'm sure we're going to see this more and more in the future. Pain assessment is very important. Uh, it's considered the fifth vital sign and pain scores should be, uh, we should aim to keep pay, uh, pain scores less than 3 out of 10 or 30 out of 100 according to the NICE and the JACO guidelines from the US. And this is really where it becomes important for us to take the lead, to train, to teach, to educate our nursing staff and our, um, the whole pain team to monitor pain at rest, at movement and to use the correct um, pain tool, whether it's the numeric rating uh, scale, visual analog scale, Wong Baker faces, in your context, so that um, pain is individualized for each patient and tested 
and not not just sort of left as a uh, generic form for each patient to be managed in exactly the same way. So when it comes to nursing staff capacity and education, nursing staff are core enablers in the management of cesarean lyric pain. Um, we often see pres prescription administration variation um, as a common cause for poor analgesia. Nursing staff workload, high patient, patient to nurse uh, ratios all contribute to poor analgesia and there's much more that can be done to improve our um, capacity and understanding if we um, empower and educate our nursing staff to be part of the team and uh, to improve our patient outcome. So um, ending off, uh, depending on the context that you're working in, whether it is in um, uh, states, um, private, in a high income setting or in a rural um, setting in, in, in South Africa and Africa, um, I think there is much more that, that can be done to individualize and personalize analgesia if we um, incorporate all these um, perioperative um, tools um, that are available. And I think individualizing risk prediction, anxiolysis, uh, labor epidural analgesia, intrathecal morphine, um, regular scheduled basic simple drugs, paracetamol and non-steroidals as part of your modal, multimodal analgesia, the use of uh, local anesthesia techniques, adjuncts whether it's ketamine or magnesium, regular pain assessment and education of nursing staff will all uh, contribute to improving patient outcomes. Um, I just want to give a um, credit to uh, Dr. Dave Bishop, Matthew Gibbs and Rob Dyer for an excellent um, article and I, I really do want uh, to encourage you all to read this um, um, review on post cesarean delivery um, analgesia in a resource limited setting uh, published in IJOA in 2019 where they give a table here that is a suggested analgesia regimens in resource limited settings and um, it takes you step by step through the options and how to go about deciding on what to use in a resource limited environment. Um, heart of the uh, press is our own updated um, Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Caesarean Delivery Analgesia Guidelines from 2020 and I want to encourage you all to read through these and be part of the team. This is uh, primarily the responsibility of the anesthetist to initiate this, but as um, team members, whether it is nursing staff, obstet obstetricians, um, or anesthetists in the wards, uh, it will depend on us as a team to ensure that our patients get um, optimal analgesia and um, so please follow these guidelines and uh, give feedback if uh, there's any improvements or any um, suggestions regarding um, our analgesia and um, what could be considered. So to end off, take home message. A one size uh, fits all approach does not work. You have to personalize the approach for each patient. Um, 